Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Today, we'll be discussing the basics of the, ba the bank examination privilege. My name is David Shuffle, and I co-chair our firm's Consumer Financial Services Practice Group. Let me introduce our speakers. To, um, to my immediate left is Eric Epstein, who is a partner in our New York office. Eric is a member of our Consumer Financial Service Practice Group. Eric has significant experience litigating consumer finance disputes. Uh, notably, Eric is the brainchild behind the bank examination privilege treatise that we prepared for the American uh, Bar Association. Eric took the laboring war in drafting many of the chapters. Uh, this is a treatise that's due out in January of, of next year, and it's truly a, a deep dive into the bank examination privilege and um, how it's used throughout the country. And there really is there's no other comparable treatise at this time, so we're excited about that. Second, we have uh, Nick Blitstra, who is a partner in our Minneapolis office. Uh, Nick advises financial service clients on a wide range of consumer legal and regulatory issues. Nick is also a co-author of the Bank Examination Privilege Treatise. Uh, can we turn to the second slide, Eric? Uh, before I turn it over to our speakers, I just want to set forth the topics that we're going to address today. First, we'll discuss the nature of the bank examination privilege. Second, we'll explain the burden shifting framework. Uh, third, we'll discuss the scope of the privilege. Fourth, we'll explain the impact that state law has on the privilege. And finally, we'll provide some practical tips. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Eric. Thanks, David. Uh, so as David mentioned, our topic today is the bank examination privilege. Uh, in banking litigation, the bank examination privilege can be a critical issue. It can really shape the dynamics uh, of a case. Uh, but surprisingly, it can be uh, difficult to find a broad overview of how the privilege works. Uh, our purpose today is to provide uh, exactly that, a general explanation or sort of bird's eye view uh, of the bank examination privilege. Uh, the bank examination privilege is a federal evidentiary privilege. Uh, by federal, I mean that it is recognized uh, by federal courts. Uh, in particular, the bank examination privilege uh, is recognized uh, in every federal circuit. Uh, in certain circuits, uh, the privilege has been recognized at the circuit court level. Uh, in other federal circuits, uh, district court decisions have recognized uh, the privilege. Uh, the privilege is evidentiary uh, in that it can impact the scope of discovery in a lawsuit. Uh, specifically, the bank examination privilege uh, can shield uh, information uh, related to confidential regulatory examinations of banks and other financial institutions. The scope of the privilege can encompass, uh, but is not necessarily limited to, uh, information contained in formal uh, official reports of examination. The basic aim of the privilege is to address attention uh, between, on the one hand, uh, regulatory examinations of the financial industry and on the other hand, uh, adversarial litigation against the financial industry. On the regulatory side, in a bank examination, uh, an examiner uh, might share with the subject institution factual findings uh, regarding the institution's policies and practices. Uh, an examiner also might offer opinions and recommendations uh, to the subject institution. Uh, if management responds, uh, a dialogue uh, might take place uh, between the examiner and bank uh, management. Uh, now, from a regulatory perspective uh, and from a bank perspective, uh, the expectation uh, is that such a dialogue between an examiner and bank management uh, will be non-adversarial, uh, constructive, uh, and as well completely confidential. Uh, every federal financial regulator uh, strictly prohibits the public dissemination of such communications uh, when such communications are meant to be confidential. The problem is that in a subsequent lawsuit, another party, uh, one who is adverse uh, to the bank uh, or adverse to the bank's regulator, uh, might have a different set of ideas. Uh, from uh, such an adversary's perspective, uh, bank examination records might be just another category of documentary evidence uh, 
uh, that might be relevant uh, to a claim, defense, or other issue uh, in a lawsuit. Uh, as a result, in banking litigation, on occasion, a party will demand uh, the production uh, of documents or information uh, related to confidential regulatory examinations of banks in anticipation of potentially using uh, such materials as evidence at trial. Uh, because of the sensitivity of such records, uh, such discovery demands and the bank examination privilege in particular uh, are often a key battleground uh, in banking litigation. The effect of the privilege uh, is to restrict such discovery to an extent. And to be clear, uh, the privilege is not always the only possible basis uh, for objecting to such a discovery demand. Uh, however, in many cases, uh, when such demands are litigated, uh, the court's uh, decision as to whether or not to compel production uh, will hinge on the bank examination privilege. On this screen, we've set forth uh, the three definitions of the privilege from uh, federal case law uh, that are cited most often. Uh, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, has described a privilege that deals with agency opinions and recommendations and banks' responses thereto. Uh, the U.S. Circuit Court for the District of Columbia uh, has referred to a privilege uh, regarding the iterative process of comment by the regulators and response by the bank. Uh, the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of uh, New York uh, has identified a privilege regarding materials related to bank examination reports. Uh, now, these definitions are worded uh, somewhat differently, and in other federal cases, one can find other formulations uh, as well. Uh, but in substance, uh, the meaning uh, of such uh, uh, definitions of the privilege uh, is similar, uh, namely that uh, as a bottom line, uh, federal courts recognize an evidentiary privilege that is concerned uh, with the confidential dialogue between bank examiners and financial institutions. The privilege is grounded in uh, two major policy concerns. Uh, and on this slide, we've uh, shown how courts have articulated uh, these uh, two concerns. Uh, the first concern is uh, that without a bank examination privilege, uh, the examination process just wouldn't work or might not work as well. Uh, as one court has put it, uh, bank management must be open and forthcoming in response to the inquiries of bank examiners. And the examiners, in turn, uh, must be frank in expressing their concerns uh, about the bank. Uh, the, the problem uh, is that if regulators or banks uh, felt that their confidential communications could be too easily exploited uh, by other constituencies in subsequent litigation, uh, regulators and banks might uh, hesitate uh, before communicating candidly under the umbrella of a bank examination. The second major policy concern that underpins uh, the privilege has to do with public confidence in the financial sector. Uh, as one court has explained, a disclosure of confidential portions of a bank report might breed public misunderstanding and unduly undermine confidence in the bank. I mentioned earlier that the bank examination privilege uh, is a federal evidentiary privilege. Uh, to be more specific, it is a federal common law evidentiary privilege. Uh, that is, it is a doctrine uh, that federal judges uh, over the course of uh, many cases uh, have created and developed uh, to address the policy problems uh, that we just reviewed. At the same time, uh, the privilege has a complex relationship with federal statutory law uh, and with federal administrative law. Uh, to explain that, I'll, I'll start with the statutory side. Uh, there is no federal statute that expressly requires uh, federal courts to recognize a privilege in the context of a lawsuit with respect to regulatory examination uh, records. Uh, to be sure, the common law privilege that federal courts have created does have the effect of helping 
uh, federal financial regulators to fulfill uh, their statutory responsibilities in the area of bank supervision. Uh, but all the same, there is no federal statute that explicitly mandates the recognition of such a privilege by the judiciary. At the same time, uh, the bank examination privilege is somewhat analogous to and runs parallel to a federal statute, uh, namely Exemption 8 of the Federal Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA. Uh, FOIA does not govern uh, litigation discovery. It is a mechanism uh, that members of the public uh, can use to request uh, documentary records uh, from uh, a federal administrative agency, uh, including but not limited uh, to uh, financial regulators. Uh, FOIA has built into it a variety of, of exemptions. Uh, each exemption uh, carves out some category of especially uh, sensitive uh, records and places them off limits uh, for purposes of FOIA requests. One such exemption is Exemption 8, uh, which uh, categorically exempts records, uh, quote, contained in uh, or related to uh, examination operating or condition reports prepared by, on behalf of, or for the use of an agency uh, responsible for the regulation or supervision of financial institutions. Now, as we'll review later, the elements of the bank examination privilege are more complex uh, than the straightforward rule that you see in Exemption 8. But Exemption 8 and the privilege are grounded in similar policy concerns about the potential harms uh, that could flow from unrestricted uh, litigation discovery uh, of financial examination records. On the regulatory side, uh, federal financial regulators uh, also uh, uh, recognize uh, these concerns. Uh, as a result, as I uh, alluded to earlier, uh, every federal financial uh, regulator has promulgated rules uh, that restrict the public dissemination uh, of confidential communications that take place in the context of a bank uh, examination. Uh, federal courts uniformly hold uh, that regulatory policy uh, in this area, uh, whatever uh, binding effect it may have on agency personnel or banks outside of court uh, does not uh, carry the force of an evidentiary privilege uh, for purposes of a lawsuit. Uh, as such, the bank examination privilege remains uh, a judicial doctrine that is administered by judges. Uh, the scope of the privilege uh, does not always mirror regulatory policy. And when the privilege is litigated, uh, outcomes do not always conform to the wishes uh, of federal regulatory agencies. Only the government has standing to assert the bank examination privilege in litigation. Uh, as a practical matter, uh, what that means is that when the privilege is litigated, however important uh, the privilege uh, or the underlying records may be to a bank, uh, the fact remains that an agency official is going to have to make a formal claim of privilege. Uh, in addition to that, an official will have to make such a privilege claim uh, based on actual personal consideration of the matter. Plus, uh, the official will have to provide, uh, in the words of one decision, a detailed specification of the information for which the privilege is claimed with an explanation as to why it properly falls within the scope of the privilege. Uh, in, in concrete terms, the agency is going to have to uh, furnish the court with something like a privilege log uh, based on a review of the issue and the records uh, that have been sought. Now, an agency might fulfill all of these prerequisites to exercising its standing to assert the privilege, but in the end, a court is going to make the decision. Uh, as the Supreme Court has held in regard to executive privileges in general, uh, ultimately, the court itself must determine whether the circumstances are appropriate for the claim of privilege, as judicial control over the evidence in a case cannot be abdicated to the caprice of executive officers. Now, this point regarding 
uh, governmental standing to assert or waive the privilege. Uh, it cuts through all procedural scenarios in litigation. Uh, on this slide, uh, we've set forth uh, the three uh, procedural situations uh, in which the privilege most often uh, tends to surface. And as we'll, we, we will review in each of these uh, sets of circumstances, uh, the government exclusively has standing to either assert or waive the bank examination uh, privilege. Uh, so in the scenario uh, we've called scenario one, uh, it might be that uh, an agency is a party to a case uh, while a bank uh, is not. Uh, perhaps the agency's adversary uh, serves a discovery demand on the agency uh, seeking copies of uh, confidential and privileged uh, regulatory examination records. Uh, now here, uh, the agency uh, and the agency alone will have standing to assert or waive the privilege, uh, notwithstanding that the records might concern the activities of a specified financial institution. Uh, in scenario two, it might be that a bank uh, is a litigant, uh, while uh, the bank's regulator uh, is not a party uh, to the case. Uh, here, uh, in uh, such a litigation, uh, the bank's adversary uh, might serve uh, some type of third party uh, discovery demand on the bank's regulator, uh, asking the regulator uh, to produce to the bank's adversary uh, records or information regarding regulatory examinations of that bank. Uh, here, uh, once again, uh, it is the agency and the agency alone uh, that will have standing to either assert uh, the privilege or opt not to uh, do so. I'll just mention as an aside uh, that uh, when litigants serve uh, third party subpoenas uh, on regulatory agencies, uh, another issue can intrude separate and apart from the bank examination uh, privilege and that is sovereign immunity. Uh, some federal courts uh, hold uh, that whether or not a privilege such as the bank examination privilege is applicable, uh, the fact remains that federal regulatory agencies are immune to third party uh, subpoenas in federal litigation. Uh, other federal courts uh, hold otherwise and the law uh, regarding this matter is, is really in disarray. Um, if anyone has questions about that point, uh, we can also explore it further uh, later on when we have time for questions. Uh, but I just wanted to, uh, to make that footnote uh, because oftentimes in response to such a subpoena, a federal regulator will assert the bank examination privilege and also raise a sovereign immunity uh, issue. Uh, the court might have to deal with uh, uh, both uh, matters. In a third uh, procedural scenario, uh, again, it might be that while an agency is not a party to a case, a bank is uh, either a plaintiff or defendant. Uh, here, it might be that the bank's adversary uh, demands that the bank itself uh, divulge information uh, regarding confidential regulatory examinations of the bank. I, in fact, uh, oftentimes uh, the underlying reason uh, that a bank's adversary seeks such records from the bank itself is to avoid uh, the sovereign immunity problem that I alluded to uh, earlier. Uh, even here, uh, the uh, government exclusively has standing to either assert or waive the bank examination privilege. Now, this scenario is unique uh, because if an agency is not a party to a case and is also not privy to a discovery demand, uh, the agency might not know uh, that the privilege is in jeopardy unless either the bank, uh, the court, uh, the proponent of the discovery request or some other party uh, affirmatively reaches out uh, to the regulator to give the regulator that information. Uh, as a result, federal courts uh, uniformly hold that this type of motion uh, to compel uh, uh, regulatory records from a bank should not be decided unless or until the relevant regulator has been given notice of the matter uh, as well as a meaningful opportunity to intervene and be heard. Although the privilege belongs exclusively to regulatory agencies, banks still play an essential role uh, in defending the privilege. Uh, the bank's role is especially important uh, in uh, those cases where a bank is a party uh, to a case, but the regulator is not. 
Uh, here, while the government uh, has standing to assert or waive the privilege, the bank is going to be on the front lines of the case. Uh, so the bank is going to be screening uh, for issues uh, uh, related to the bank examination privilege. Uh, the bank is going to be alerting its regulator to such issues as they arise. Plus, if or when the privilege is litigated, uh, the bank might have to play an important supporting role. Since in as much as the bank is a party to the case, the bank might have information about the case or about the discovery demand uh, that the bank's regulator uh, does not possess. The role that banks play in defending the privilege uh, is a practical necessity, uh, but it's also enshrined in the policies of federal regulators. Uh, to take uh, an example, an OCC regulation, which we've set forth here on this slide, provides that without OCC approval, uh, no person or entity may disclose non-public OCC information except after the requester has sought the information from the OCC and as ordered by a federal court in a judicial proceeding in which the OCC has had the opportunity to appear and oppose discovery. Uh, the regulation goes on to say that violators may be subject to the penalties provided in 18 USC uh, 641, which is a federal embezzlement statute. One of the practical takeaways from this type of uh, regulation, again, has to do with the role that banks need to play in defending the privilege when a bank is a litigant uh, in a federal case. Uh, in particular, as mentioned, uh, in the course of such litigation, there might come a time uh, when the bank's adversary serves a discovery demand on the bank, uh, seeking copies of uh, regulatory examination reports uh, or information. Uh, now, in response to such a demand, uh, a bank might say, look, we object uh, because uh, our regulator needs to take a look at this matter, and ultimately our regulator may opt uh, or might not uh, to assert uh, the bank examination privilege, uh, plus a court uh, might agree. Uh, so we need to withhold these records. Uh, the problem is that the bank's adversary uh, might respond uh, that, look, it's all well and good that you intend to discuss this matter with your regulator, uh, but at this point, uh, it seems that your regulator has not yet asserted the privilege. So here and now, there is no viable legal basis for you, the bank, uh, to withhold uh, these records uh, since the bank unilaterally uh, lacks standing to assert uh, the privilege. Uh, this type of uh, argument uh, can create uh, a real conundrum uh, for a bank, which on the one hand will want to comply with its discovery obligations, uh, yet on the other hand uh, uh, wants to have due regard uh, for a, a regulator's standing uh, to assert or waive uh, the privilege. Uh, the import of this type of regulation uh, is that from a regulatory perspective, uh, it is appropriate and it is expected uh, that a bank will continue to withhold records pending regulatory review uh, and ultimately pending uh, a court order. Uh, in fact, a bank in an initial privilege log uh, will often cite this type of regulation to explain uh, why uh, certain potentially privileged materials are being withheld pending regulatory review. One of, uh, or perhaps the most frequently cited uh, decision uh, regarding the bank examination privilege is a 1992 uh, decision uh, by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit uh, in re subpoena served upon controller of uh, the currency. Uh, in the in re subpoena case, uh, the original lawsuit was filed in federal court in Rhode Island. Uh, it was a shareholder class action and derivative suit uh, brought against a bank uh, and bank officers. Uh, the shareholder uh, plaintiffs alleged uh, that the bank and its officers uh, had intentionally uh, released misleading information uh, about, about the bank's potential exposure to losses associated with real estate loans. Uh, during the course of uh, pretrial discovery, the plaintiffs uh, first demanded that the bank itself uh, produce confidential communications uh, between the bank uh, and its regulators, the OCC and the Federal Reserve. 
uh, in the plaintiff's view, uh, such records could offer a unique and objective contemporaneous chronicle of the true financial status of the bank and the defendant's knowledge. The bank uh, refused this demand, as it probably was obligated to do under applicable uh, regulations. Uh, the plaintiffs then took the next step and made a similar demand on the OCC and the Federal Reserve. Uh, when these regulators also objected, uh, the plaintiffs brought a new proceeding against these regulators uh, in the uh, District of Columbia Federal Court uh, to enforce uh, this discovery request. But initially, uh, the district court in the District of uh, Columbia uh, concurred with the plaintiff's position and rejected the regulator's uh, assertion of a bank examination privilege. Uh, the district court's reasoning was based on the concept of waiver. Uh, the district court started from the general premise uh, that when the parties to a privileged uh, communication opt to share the communication with a third party who was not originally privy uh, to that uh, dialogue, uh, the, uh, any applicable privilege might be waived, uh, depending on uh, the circumstances. So applying that concept here, the district court held uh, that the relevant examination records might well have been privileged when they took the form of a purely internal communication from an examiner to other agency personnel. Uh, but uh, the district court concluded that once the agency chose to share copies of examination reports with the subject institution, uh, any applicable privilege was waived. Uh, in the district court's words, uh, just don't send the reports to the banks and then you won't have a problem. Uh, the, regula uh, the regulators appealed the matter to the circuit court level and the circuit court rejected the district court's reasoning and found that there was no waiver under these uh, circumstances. Uh, the circuit court uh, uh, noted that the principal purpose of the bank examination privilege is to shield the dialogue that takes place between examiners uh, and supervised uh, institutions. Uh, so when that dialogue takes place, which might include sharing formal reports of examination, uh, that dialogue is not a waiver of the privilege. It is the core concern of the privilege. Uh, in the circuit court's words, providing a report to a bank is a fundamental part of the regulatory process. So to hold that the privilege is waived or even weakened merely because the regulator provides the report to a bank would quickly render the privilege a dead letter. The in -ray subpoena decision uh, in effect also highlights uh, the relationship between the bank examination privilege and the deliberative process privilege. The deliberative process privilege, uh, as one court has explained, protects the deliberative and decision-making processes of the executive branch. Now, the deliberative process privilege ordinarily focuses on inter- and intra-agency communications. A number of federal courts have described uh, the bank examination privilege as a branch of the deliberative process privilege. Uh, as one court has put it, under the penumbra of government deliberations, courts have recognized a privilege for materials related to bank examination reports. Uh, however, importantly, unlike other facets of the deliberative process privilege, the bank examination privilege is not concerned exclusively with inter or intra-agency communications. It also can extend to external communications uh, between an agency and a regulated bank or other financial institution. Uh, so in a sense, that was really the point uh, of the NRA subpoena decision. Uh, we're now uh, going to start getting into uh, greater detail about the specific criteria that courts use uh, to decide bank examination privilege uh, disputes. Uh, federal courts use a, a burden shifting framework. Initially, uh, a regulator will bear a burden of persuasion. That burden is to show uh, that the communication at issue uh, reflects or would reveal an examiner's confidential opinions or recommendations. Uh, if a regulator can meet that burden, then a court will find that the privilege is applicable. 
Uh, however, that's not necessarily the end of the story. Uh, the burden of, pers of, of persuasion will now shift uh, to the regulator's opponent, who will have an opportunity to show good cause for breaching the privilege and for compelling disclosure notwithstanding uh, the applicability of the privilege. In short, the privilege might apply, but on the other hand, it might not be enforceable uh, depending on the circumstances. Uh, there is a, a legal test uh, that governs uh, the way that a federal court will review a good cause argument. Uh, it's a five-factor balancing test. Uh, no single factor in the balancing test is dispositive. Uh, a federal court will undertake a fresh balancing of the factors uh, in each instance. Uh, that is, from one lawsuit to the next, uh, the five-factor balancing test might come out differently. Uh, and even under the umbrella of one lawsuit, uh, the five factors might balance uh, differently from one document to the next, or, or even when a document contains uh, separate and distinct sections. The essence of the test uh, is that the party seeking uh, to breach the privilege is going to have to show that it has a particularized need for the documents. Together with that, a court is going to balance the stated interests in disclosure uh, against uh, the regulator's interests in non-disclosure. Uh, here we've set forth uh, the five factors, uh, the first of which is relevance. Uh, so need needless to say, uh, if a party uh, who has propounded a discovery demand can show uh, that the sought after documents are highly relevant to a claim or defense, uh, a court might be more likely uh, to permit a breach of the privilege and to compel disclosure. The second factor is the availability of other non-privileged sources of information. Uh, in many cases, uh, on the one hand, uh, a party might seek the production uh, of privileged examination records, but at the same time, similar substantive information might exist in other caches of documents or from other sources that are not privileged. Uh, so under, that, under such circumstances, a court might wonder uh, why a party is insistent on breaching uh, the privilege itself. The third factor is the seriousness of the litigation. Uh, if a court feels that a litigation is unusually uh, meritorious, important to the parties, or important to the public interest, a court might be uh, more likely uh, to see the balance tip in favor of disclosure. The fourth factor is the role of the government in a litigation. Uh, if, a, if the government is a party uh, or has a monetary or other material stake uh, in a case, uh, a court often is more likely uh, to permit the privilege to be breached. I'll, I'll just mention here as an aside uh, that there is a, a line of cases uh, which has not been uh, uniformly accepted, uh, to the effect that when the government is a litigant, the bank examination privilege cannot apply at all under any circumstances. But as mentioned, uh, some federal case law has uh, uh, taken issue with that conclusion. Uh, the fifth factor is the possible chilling effect of disclosure on future uh, examinations. Uh, if a court feels that a compelling disclosure uh, might cause regulators or uh, examiners to hesitate to candidly communicate with each other in bank examinations, uh, a court might be uh, less likely uh, to permit a breach of the privilege. Uh, so at this point, uh, we thought we'd go through uh, two examples of how this burden shifting framework uh, uh, can uh, come to bear in actual cases. Uh, we'll review a case uh, in which uh, disclosure was denied uh, and then we'll review a case in which disclosure was compelled uh, based on this uh, burden shifting framework. Uh, so a case in which uh, disclosure was denied uh, was a decision uh, from the US District Court in the Northern District of Illinois, uh, in Ray Bank One securities litigation. Uh, this case was a securities fraud uh, class action uh, brought against a bank. Uh, during the course of pretrial discovery, uh, the plaintiffs demanded that the bank produce confidential uh, regulatory examination records. Uh, and the plaintiffs also served a similar demand on the bank's regulator, uh, the OCC. Uh, the court uh, uh, 
in, in order to decide this uh, dispute, since the regulator and the bank uh, both opposed this demand based on the bank examination privilege, uh, which led to litigation of the matter uh, before the court itself, uh, the court broke the burden shifting uh, framework down into two steps. Uh, the first step was, again, to determine the applicability of the privilege. And the second step was to determine the enforceability of the privilege based on the five-factor good cause test. Uh, in terms of step one, uh, the court reviewed uh, in camera a sampling of the requested records and found in the court's words that the records predominantly contained opinions and or recommendations as opposed to facts. Uh, so the court found that the privilege was applicable and the burden then shifted uh, to the plaintiffs to show good cause for breaching the privilege, which the court found the plaintiffs were unable to do. Uh, in terms of the first uh, factor, the court recognized uh, that the requested records uh, might address potential regulatory infractions uh, by the defendant. However, in terms of the second factor, the plaintiffs already had the same raw factual materials. Uh, that is, in the court's view, to the extent uh, an examiner might have found a regulatory infraction, an examiner would have done so by reviewing facts uh, about the bank's business practices. It just so happened that here, uh, the plaintiffs clearly already had uh, from the bank the same documents uh, and other business records that an examiner might have reviewed. Uh, so the plaintiffs could do their own analysis. They didn't need uh, regulatory reports. Uh, the, uh, the court found that the case was serious enough uh, given the need to promote sound, reliable financial data. Uh, the government had no role uh, in the case uh, but uh, the court was uh, deeply concerned that compelling disclosure could have a chilling effect on future examinations, uh, and in particular could make examiners reluctant to capture the full breadth of their opinions and thoughts in written format for fear of future disclosure. Uh, so in this case, uh, the court denied a motion to compel. Uh, in another case, uh, in Ray Powell, which was decided by a federal court uh, in Vermont, uh, a court compelled uh, disclosure uh, based on uh, the same burden shifting framework. Uh, this case uh, was a personal bankruptcy matter. Uh, the bankruptcy trustee, on behalf of the debtors, uh, sued a bank, uh, alleging that the bank had made misrepresentations to the debtors in connection with a commercial loan. Uh, here, the trustee uh, styled its discovery demand a bit more narrowly. Uh, the trustee specifically sought any factual information contained in supervisory correspondence regarding the institution's credit uh, administration practices. Uh, the trustee served uh, this discovery demand on the FDIC, uh, the institution's regulator. Uh, in terms of step one of the burden shifting uh, framework, the court found that the privilege was inapplicable. Uh, because any opinions which might be contained in these materials could be redacted out uh, or separated from the factual material. Uh, I guess the court could have stopped there, uh, but by way of exploring an alternative argument, the court also looked at the five-factor good cause test, which in the court's view uh, also tipped in favor of disclosure. Uh, the, in terms of the first factor relevance, uh, the court concluded that Regulators likely had come across evidence of negligence on the part of the bank uh, to the extent that the bank uh, had committed negligent acts as alleged by the plaintiffs. The requested examination reports were likely to be the best and most complete evidence of any negligence. Uh, the case involved serious allegations against a licensed banking institution. Uh, the government had no role uh, in the case. Uh, but uh, the court felt that there was unlikely to be a chilling effect on future regulatory examinations since any opinions or recommendations were going to be redacted uh, before uh, production could be made. Uh, so uh, the court therefore uh, compelled disclosure. Uh, so we're now going to explore in greater depth uh, some issues related to the scope of the privilege. And in order to do that, I'm going to uh, first pass the baton to Nick. Uh, who will walk through uh, various aspects of the examination process itself. Thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, we thought it'd be helpful to talk a little bit about bank examinations generally, just to give some more context to the discussion about the scope of the privilege. 
banking is one of the most heavily regulated industries in the United States. Um, banks are regulated and supervised as a whole by federal uh, regulators and state regulators. And bank examination is the primary tool used by uh, those regulators to supervise the banks um, that they've been charged with, um, with supervising. Um, banks are examined by the regulatory bodies who have been charged with supervising them, and who has been charged with supervising a particular bank depends a lot on the, on the bank's charter. And as we'll discuss here, you'll see the supervision responsibilities are overlapping in many respects. Um, and they're more nuanced than, than, than we have time to go into, but what I'm about to discuss is kind of a, a, a rule of thumb with respect to those, with respect to who the regulators are that we're talking about. Please. Thank you. Um, obviously, the uh, Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the OCC, um, uh, is in this space. It's an independent bureau within the U.S. Treasury Department. It oversees and examines federally chartered uh, banks, which includes national banks, Federal Savings Associations or thrifts, uh, the domestic branches and agencies of, of, uh, of foreign banks. And the OCC is one of the regulators that is often referred to as a prudential regulator, which in, means in part that it has, has jurisdiction and examines with respect to both compliance with applicable law and regulations, but also with respect to the safety and soundness of the financial condition and operation of the banks that it's, uh, that it's supervising. The Federal Reserve um, has jurisdiction over all state and national banks that are Fed member banks. Um, obviously, um, that overlaps with what I've just described um, the OCC as supervising and, and that it supervises national or federally chartered banks. So that from an examination perspective, the Fed tends to focus on state, state banks that are Fed member banks. The Fed also has jurisdiction to examine bank holding companies including bank holding companies that own national banks, and so its examination um, activities take place in that space as well. The Fed, too, is considered a prudential regulator, meaning it's also it's doing compliance with law examinations, but also looking at the safety and soundness of the institution that it's examining. The FDIC, as a deposit insuring agency, uh, has jurisdiction to, to technically to examine any banks that it's where it's insuring uh, deposits, but because of the examination activity I've just described with respect to the OCC and the Fed, the FDIC's examination activity often focuses on state chartered banks that are not Fed um, Fed system uh, members. State banking regulators are also in this examination space. Obviously, that's describing a category of agencies and not a particular body as the, as the um, prior examples. All 50 states in the District of Columbia have their own state banking agencies that are, that are charged with supervision and examination of the, of the state banks that are chartered in that, in that, um, in that particular state. And finally, the, the latest arrival to this kind of general list, is obviously, is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. As we all know, under the Dodd-Frank Act, they've been given responsibility for examining uh, banks that have $10 billion or more in, in total assets. Unlike the regulators I discussed so far, the CFPB does not have a safety and soundness mandate. Its mandate concerns the consumer experience and compliance with federal consumer uh, financial law and regulation. And so its examinations are focused uh, on that topic and not on the safety and soundness of the financial institution. The next slide, which I'll just, I won't, I won't walk through, but kind of simplifies that, what I just described, and kind of shows some of the um, overlapping examine, primary examination responsibilities that, those, that these agencies may have with respect to a particular bank based on on its charter, so you can see that that um, you know really no matter what what kind of bank you're dealing with, you may have you may have multiple uh, entities that are interested or responsible for examining for examining the bank in question. Go to the next slide. And so, what are what are examinations about? Well, generally speaking, and as I've mentioned, you know, for the federal prudential regulators are looking at safety and soundness issues, in addition to compliance with applicable law and regulations. Um, is part of the, um, and, so, and so the OCC, the Fed, the, the FDIC, state banking regulators will have that, will have the, those focuses. As part of the examiner's qualitative assess, assessment of safety and soundness, um, the examiner obviously is making 
qualitative and narrative findings with respect to the bank's uh, condition and operations, but also uh, is typically making numerical ratings of the of the bank's safety and soundness in a number of categories. The 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 system that's used by most of the federal, but is used is used by the federal prudential regulators and many state banking regulators is the Uniform Financial Institutions Rating System, which assigns a number of uniform rating numbers to banks in a number of categories that are believed to be kind of common across financial institutions. That system is more often known as the CAMELS uh, rating system because of the six categories that are, being, um, that are being rated by the regulator in the examination in this area, those being uh, capital adequacy, which is the C of CAMELS, asset quality, management, earnings, liquidity, and sensitivity um, to market risk. So in, a, in evaluating these six uh, performance areas, the examiners are going to uh, assign a CAMELS rating, one through five, one being the, the best or strongest rating, the, the rating having the least supervisory concern, and five being the, the weakest or lowest or rating that, that indicates the most, um, supervi the, the most supervisory um, concern. The examiners typically also give a composite rating, which is an overall rating of the, of the condition of the institution. It's not just the mathematical average of the, the six camels numbers that I just mentioned, although it clearly needs to reflect, would reflect the, the, the strength of the ratings of the institution as received in those in those areas, but can be, uh, but the you know the weight given to the different uh, the different components can vary from institution to institution depending on its its characteristics and the nature of the um, of the regulation. Um, in addition to kind of that kind of full scope examinations, the the regulators also can do targeted examinations, which may um, which may um, focus instead on a on a discrete or specialty area within the bank, for instance, anti-money laundering or BSA um, uh, compliance or credit risk could, could uh, focus on certain functions, such as internal audit function of the, of the bank, um, or it may focus on particular issues or products like credit card or mun municipal um, securities. Also, horizontal examinations um, are another type of examination that may often take place in which the regulator is actually examining simultaneously or effectively simultaneously a number of banks, uh, a group of banks on the same, uh, on the same issue or uh, of concern. Um, a spe special note on, on CFP, CFPB examinations, they, they do differ from traditional banking regulator examinations, as I mentioned, because the, the safety and soundness component is not, is not there. However, the, the, the mechanics, generally speaking, can, can be very much the same. There would be a notice of, uh, of an examination, request for documents before, during, and after the examination um, takes place, interviews of key employees and, and management, and conclude with an, and concluding the examination with a report of examination, uh, and including a, a uh, consumer compliance rating that's not technically a CAMELS rating, but still uses that same one through five um, rating system that I already discussed. Um, and like the prudential regulators, the CFPB uh, can do regularly scheduled periodic examinations, but it may do targeted and horizontal examinations um, as well. Uh, as I alluded to, and as Eric has also mentioned, the formal examination process typically uh, results in the issuance of a report of examination, often called the ROE. Uh, which summarizes the exam activities and findings, and will include the compliant the ratings that I've just um, that I've just discussed, as well as narrative um, findings and opinions as well. Um, it may uh, go on to describe supervisory concerns or deficiencies that have been identified in the course of the examination, and may also describe corrective action that the examining regulatory agency believes the bank needs to undertake in order to address the supervisory concerns that have been identified. Typically, those reports of examination are provided to the to senior management and the board of directors, so the bank's aware at the highest levels what the findings of the examination were and what concerns, if any, the regulator might have, and the corrective action that the regulator is expecting that the bank will undertake in order to address those um, problems. 
obviously in connection with the issuance of that report of examination, there may be a lot of back and forth between the regulator and senior management and the board of the, of the bank uh, regarding the findings or facts, uh, attempts to correct factual misunderstandings that, that may have on, uh, the bank may believe has come up in the course of the examination and other, and other aspects of the content of the ROE. Uh, and supervisory communication obviously not limited to, to, to that uh, kind of paradigm that I've just described. Um, bank regulators and the banks they examine uh, often work actively together on an ongoing or regular uh, basis. There can be a lot of contact between the bank and the regulators um, long after the close of the formal examination. For instance, if they're trying to address problems that were identified in the, in the report of examination, there may be on-site or off-site monitoring that the regulator is undertaking with respect to the banks, uh, the bank in question. As many of us know as well, at, especially at larger institutions, there may, be, there may be resident examiners who actually have offices in, in the institution and, are, and so are in the bank on a, on a daily basis and having periodic or occasional meetings on any number of topics that might be a con concern to the regulator with um, with bank, with bank staff um, and, and management. And, uh, and inevitably all these contacts will result in provision of uh, materials and information and written communications back and forth between the bank um, and the regulator. Of course, if, if remedial action is taken, if there's a, if there's a, um, a cease and desist order or a memorandum of, uh, memorandum of understanding or other, um, other type of uh, remedial action taken that also results in addition, additional communication between the regulator and the bank. With respect to confidential, I won't go over, I think Eric's touch, touched on that, on that piece. I mean, obviously there's a lot of concern about um, this, this type of information becoming public and not causing a, you know, a run on the bank or, or, other, or other problems with respect to public dissemination of regulator opinions with respect to banks' performance and soundness. Okay. Uh Thanks, Nick. Uh, so with that common baseline about how the examination process works, uh, we can talk in uh, somewhat more concrete terms about the scope of the privilege. Now, there are uh, much, much of the federal case law regarding the bank examination privilege uh, deals with one narrow area, uh, namely uh, the application of the privilege to formal reports of examination regarding bank safety and soundness. <clears throat> issued by the OCC or other prudential uh, regulators. Uh, reading that line of case law alone might create a, a misimpression that the scope of the privilege is limited uh, to that domain. Uh, but in fact, the privilege also can extend beyond that area. Uh, courts uh, uh, have applied the privilege uh, to, for example, uh, communications other than formal examination reports, uh, communications flowing from banks to regulators, uh, even internal bank communications, uh, examinations that deal with matters other than safety and soundness, uh, and examinations of non-bank financial institutions. In each instance, uh, the legal test for the applicability of the privilege remains precisely the same. The question is whether the communication reveals uh, the confidential opinions or recommendations of an examiner. Uh, one recent illustration of this point uh, can be found uh, in a a 2013 decision uh, by the U.S. District Court of the Southern District of New York, uh, Federal Housing Finance Agency v. J.P. Morgan Chase & Co. Uh, in this action, the FHFA uh, sued various financial institutions that were involved in the residential mortgage-backed securities industry. Uh, the defendants propounded discovery demands on the FHFA, uh, seeking information regarding the FHFA's uh, examinations of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, or the, the GSEs. Uh, the FHFA, in response, invoked the bank examination privilege. Uh, now, uh, uh, the uh, defendants uh, objected uh, to the FHFA's invocation of the privilege, uh, and the matter was litigated. Uh, the threshold issue uh, for the court in that regard uh, was whether the FHFA, which is not a traditional bank regulator, is even eligible uh, to raise the privilege. Uh, as explained by the court, the defendant's argument uh, was that the bank examination privilege cannot apply to the FHFA because the GSEs are not banks and the FHFA is not a bank uh, regulator. Uh, the 
court ultimately rejected that argument and found that the FHFA could invoke the privilege. Uh, as the court reasoned, uh, the question here is whether the distinctive necessity for candid and informal regulation of the banking sector, which undergirds the privilege, applies also to the FHFA's regulation of the GSEs. Uh, it does. The court went on to note there is no authority for the proposition that the privilege turns on the nature of the regulated entity. Uh, so having found that the FHFA was eligible uh, to invoke the privilege, uh, the court went on to uh, use uh, the, uh, the usual methodology uh, for examining the applicability and enforceability uh, of the privilege. Uh, the court reviewed documents in camera, uh, considered uh, whether the documents reflected opinions and recommendations, and so forth. Uh, ultimately, uh, the court enforced the privilege uh, with, re with respect to a variety of materials, uh, including but not limited to official reports of examinations. Uh, such as communications from the GSEs to the FHFA uh, that reflected recommendations of items to be discussed at a joint meeting, for example, uh, or communications flowing from GSEs to the FHFA providing narrative answers uh, to questions uh, and so forth. So these types of informal communications, uh, even communications flowing to the regulator, uh, were in the court's view within the scope of the privilege. Uh, we thought we'd uh, switch gears now and talk a bit about how this issue is dealt with at the state level uh, under state law, uh, which can be quite different uh, from the, the doctrine that federal courts recognize. In most states, a bank examination privilege, if it exists at all, is statutory. Uh, there are, uh, surveying the 50 states, there are basically three types of statutes. Uh, first are statutes that provide that bank examinations while confidential outside of litigation, uh, are not privileged in a lawsuit. Uh, second, uh, there are some statutes that create a strict and absolute evidentiary privilege uh, for information regarding confidential bank examinations, even in litigation. Uh, third are some state statutes that strike a balance and create a qualified uh, privilege that resembles, in many respects, uh, the federal rule. Uh, as a footnote, uh, these state statutes uh, tend not to use the term bank examination privilege, so that, that phrase uh, rarely appears in state court uh, jurisprudence. Uh, because federal and state law uh, are not completely unified uh, in this area, uh, federal courts uh, often have to decide which body of law to apply. Uh, under the federal rules of evidence, it's not a given uh, that a federal court necessarily will use federal privilege law in a federal case. Uh, a federal court is often going to have to undertake uh, a vertical choice of law analysis and decide whether to apply federal or state law. The rule that governs this vertical choice of law analysis uh, is Federal Rule of Evidence uh, 501. Uh, which holds that uh, the common law, federal common law, governs a claim of privilege unless any of the following provides otherwise, uh, the Constitution, a federal statute, or Supreme Court rules. But state law governs privilege regarding a claim or defense for which state law supplies the rule of decision. Now, many federal courts interpret Rule 501 to create a dichotomy. On the one hand, uh, in a pure diversity jurisdiction case uh, where the party's claims and defenses are grounded solely in state law, uh, a federal court should apply state privilege law. Uh, at the opposite end of the spectrum, in a pure federal law case, a court should apply federal privilege law under this reading of Rule 501. Now, this interpretation of the rule uh, can produce uh, uh, strange results with respect to the bank examination privilege. Uh, and one example of that uh, lies in the In Ray Powell decision, which I alluded to uh, earlier. That was the case where a party uh, sought privileged examination records from the FDIC. Now, as we reviewed earlier, uh, the court uh, rejected the FDIC's uh, invocation of the federal common law privilege. And one reason for that was that the elements of the privilege were not met in the court's view. Uh, but there was another separate and alternative reason uh, as well, and it had to do with Federal Rule of Evidence 501. Uh, as the court noted, the party's claims and defenses in the Powell case emanated solely from state law, uh, specifically Vermont state law. Uh, so the court reasoned under Rule 501, 
the federal privilege doesn't govern at all. We need to look to Vermont law and identify the applicable Vermont statute that deals with the discoverability of this type of information. Having identified that statute, uh, the court construed the statute uh, and found that it was one of those state statutes uh, that does not create an evidentiary privilege uh, with respect to uh, regulatory examinations in a lawsuit. Uh, so for this reason as well, uh, the court compelled the FDIC to produce the requested information in its entirety. Um, so stepping back, the results uh, can seem somewhat counterintuitive. Here you have a federal court compelling a federal regulator to produce records of a federal bank examination based on a state statute. Uh, but many federal courts have found that this type of outcome uh, is mandated uh, under Rule 501. Uh, so uh, I think at this point, I'll, David, I'll turn it over to you to review um, a few pa practice tips with uh, the time Thanks. that we have. Thanks. We, we only, only have about a minute or yeah. so, and I, yeah. I, I don't want to keep people over. Yeah. So let me just quickly go through a few items. Yeah. Um, tip one, the privilege extends to oral testimony, not just the records and documents that Eric was talking about. And just briefly, what does that mean and in what context can that arise? And it's typically the most common example is, is at a deposition if a bank employee is, is testifying and plaintiff's counsel or adversary questions the witness about confidential bank examination material. You know, and in that instance, it's critical that counsel object and try to shut that down completely because um, uh, it, it's critical to do that and give the, the regulator a chance and the court to then weigh in to the applicability of the, of the privilege. A second and rare instance that it may arise is if a deposition is taken of a bank examiner or other high-ranking uh, regulatory official. That's a rare instance because uh, regulatory agencies have rules that make it uh, difficult and require a party to make a compelling showing to, to have that deposition. So if we turn to the second tip, I'm not going to spend much time on this. I just want to alert all the folks that it's not just the bank examination privilege that would apply to bank examination reports. You also have suspicious activity report um, privilege, you have attorney client privilege, you have hearsay. So there's multiple privileges that can be raised to protect uh, the disclosure of this information. And just the final point, um, just want to mention that you know when a bank is litigating a case and issues arise regarding the privilege, it's critical to get the regulator involved right away. The regulator has an incentive to help the bank and preserve the privilege given the free flow of information that's exchanged. It's really critical. And just a, just a final point, I just want to note that you know, Eric and I have, um, have been involved in cases in which the bank examination privilege was heavily litigated. It was, uh, a, played a major role in litigation. And we've had adversaries who have really fought tooth and nail to get at this information. As many of you know, there, there is oftentimes harmful information in reports or emails and, um, and letters that, that can be used to really hurt you in a class action or, or big litigation. So it's critical that the bank is aware of this privilege and ut utilizes it to its fullest. Uh, I don't want to go on any further because I know we're going over a little bit, but to the extent anyone has questions, um, feel free to raise them or we can, we'll stick around for a bit, a bit afterwards. Thanks. Thanks.